Oh, see, the inspirational music just ended. That means it's time to begin Logic Live. Greetings, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so happy to see y'all, see y'all, see your smiling faces and your, well, what I'm assuming are all smiling faces. Uh, everybody, please make sure to uh, set your chat settings to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see what you're typing. And uh, and welcome to Logic Live. Let's get this thing going here. All right. Logic Live, as always, is brought to you by Synesis.io, solutions, development, integration, and support. These guys have been my personal reseller for 15 years, and I could not do, uh, we could not do what we do at our company without them. For more information about their remote streaming solutions, please check out their website at Synesis.io. Synesis, supporting flame artists since 1997. It has been a huge couple of weeks here in Logic Land. Uh, we launched the new forum at forum.logic.tv. I see Randy's here. Uh, Randy, I'm, I'm hands a round of applause for Randy McEntee here. All right, who's the brains behind the operation? If you haven't had a chance to check out the new forum, please do. Just go to forum.logic.tv and sign up. Uh, we uh, discussed it on the show last week. We had um, several hundred members. Randy, if you could give us some stats in the in the uh, in the chat, that would be great. I think it was forty thousand page views uh, as of last week or something like that. So it's really fifty thousand. Wait a minute, I'm going to play something for that. Huh? There you go, 50. <laughs> it was Randy, by the way, who taught me how to add sound effects to my stream deck. So 50,001, wait, there we go. <laughs> I see a theme here. Um, but the forum is going strong and uh, I'm really excited. Today we're gonna to be giving away one of the uh, Logic phone chargers to uh, a lucky entrant into the, um, the two sentence uh, tip little category that Randy set up over there, which is a great collection of, of tips and tricks. Uh, we also launched a new one frame of white for 2020. Uh, one frame of white is back and better than ever. So uh, for those of you in the list here who uh, aren't familiar with, with uh, one frame of white, I can't imagine that there are any of you, but uh, just in case, one frame of white is the greatest, uh, the greatest creative challenge of all time. Your challenge is to make the most amazing thing you can think of using only the tools in flame. And the theme for this year is joy, because damn it, I don't think we've ever needed something funny or something happy or something inspiring more than we do right now. Maximum length of the entries is 30 seconds. And the contest is underway. Entries are due on September 30th at the end of my day. And we're gonna announce the winners on uh, October 11th here on Logic Live. Everyone who enters receives a 30-day license of Sapphire OFX, which you can use in your project. And you can download a 30-day trial of Flame. Details uh, on how to do that and everything else are at oneframeofwhite.com. And hey, let's talk about prizes for a minute. We've got a tremendous lineup of prizes this year. First place is a Dell Precision 7750 mobile workstation, courtesy of our friends at Dell, Intel, and NVIDIA. And this is an actual frame I pulled off of the Dell website so uh that looks like flame and uh and seeing it on someone else's website other than my own or autodesks is a beautiful thing this is a fully loaded workstation and i'm looking forward to giving this away i can't wait second place is a 12-month license of flame and third place is a 12-month license of flare courtesy of our friends at autodesk fourth place is an io 4k from aja fifth place a 12-month license of everything that boris offers in the boris effect suite Sixth place is a $500 store credit to actionvfx.com, the absolute best stock footage on the internet. Seventh place is a set of AirPods Pro from our friends at Cinesis. And eighth place is a $99 gift certificate to FXPHD. Again, the contest is on now. There's still some time left. It's never too late. So if you want to sign up, head on over to oneframeofwhite.com and fill out a registration form. All right, let me stop the share. And there we go. And let's invite Christoph to turn his camera on. It's hello, uh, Andy. Hey, hi. Look at you, you know what? It's always golden hour uh, behind. Yeah, uh, you, you don't want to see it. the real background, so I thought I'd uh, <laughs> make Zoom do some cheap keying for me. So uh, yeah, from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hamburg. <laughs> Well, welcome back, man. You were uh, you were on uh, the fourth episode of Logic Live, showing us uh, Nuke for Flame Artists, and um, it's it's we're at episode twenty six. It's been six months since we've yeah. been doing this, and uh, I just want to thank you so much for for being a part of it in the beginning and helping to get this thing going. And yeah. uh, and welcome back. Thank you back, for getting man. the whole thing rolling. I mean, this is this is awesome. Amen. Well, let's dive right in, man. Uh, you're going to show us some beauty techniques in Flame, correct? 
Correct. So I'm going to start my screen sharing here. So now you should see, oh, so now you should see my flame. And the first thing I want to talk about is the A2 Beauty shader. I think everybody knows about it by now. And I've seen in the audience, uh, Alex Oz is here and he um, a year ago probably gave me a, a really helpful rundown. So I'm going to try my best to repeat that for you guys in the audience because A2 Beauty is a really powerful tool. So um, what A2 Beauty is trying to replicate for those who don't know is uh, a procedural way of replicating uh, the dodge and burn effect. So dodge and burn, if you Google that, you'll find a plethora of tutorials who suspiciously all run a little bit over 10 minutes to break the YouTube ad market. And they absolutely tell you nothing about this except that you can dodge and burn in Photoshop. Um, the technique originated in uh, the photochemical processes. So it actually meant that you dodged or burned parts of your image by expo uh, exposing them longer or shorter or by hiding them behind a little flag. So that was the original idea. So what we are seeing now is the procedural way of doing it in flame. And A2 Beauty, as I said, is a matchbox shader. So we're gonna pull that right up and it's right up here on the top of the list. And I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit, get rid of my panel. So now you should all see that. And I'm gonna concentrate on her nose here. So um, if we switch to the result view, you can already see something happening. And this is the first thing I usually do when starting anything in Nature Beauty is dial the recovery amount back to zero. So really, I don't want any recovery happening, which means res restoration of details. I wanna set up my fix first, which is this area here. So I'm gonna dial this up. And if you haven't got any ratio or angle set up, this will look on first glance like a normal blur. So I'm gonna set it up to somewhere like here. And then you can give this a ratio, something like that. You can pull it above one. I don't think a lot happens above one. So now we, you see now it looks like a directional blur. We've seen that before. We can now change the angle. And as I said, I'm concentrating on the nose here. So if we go back to the source view, you can see I'm trying to find a setting where I lose all the spots here. And I especially picked that image because we've got some big, uh, big dimples. We've got some small molds. So it's a nice uh, mixture of different things we normally would have to tackle with front offsets or things like that. So let's see, let's go back to the result view, bring this somewhere like here. So now I'm losing all of that. So now I can start to bring back my detail. I want the, to do this very slowly. And now you see you're getting this pore structure back. We're not getting the, the uh, zits back, but rather just, just a little bit of texture. And you can further refine that by changing the size. So this is the size of the restore. If you dial this down too low, this will look very, um, very strange, very patternly, so to speak. And you can also change the search radius, which means it changes the area around uh, each, each fix, how, how big that search area is. So let's set it up to something like here. So now if you imagine if we would mask this just for the nose, this would be a, a good start to give me a clean patch of that nose rather than, um, than, what I, uh, than the original nose. So what we also got here is the ability to bring back highlights and shadows. Um, I would advise you to use this really, really carefully because if you dial these up, you're restoring the original highlights. So you can see, I just turned this to a value of 0.27 uh, and already I'm getting the highlights of the zits back onto the nose. If I crank this up, you see now, now I get all the highlights back. Same with the shadows. And this, what I'm doing right now is basically what you never ever wanna do, crank up <laughs> both to one because then you're landing on your original image. You're restoring back all the highlights, all the shadows. This is really, 
this is for nothing. So let's bring this back to a re really, really reasonable amount. Something like that, or leave it off altogether. So something like that. And lastly, if you wanna see where the effect is taking place the most, you can switch on this dodge burn preview, which basically is a difference key showing you where the effect happens the most. So this is like the basic setup without any mats applied. But we all learned from Andy's great course last week that we can use machine learning to gener generate ourselves some mats. So um, I'm gonna skip over that part because we all learned that. I'm just gonna duplicate my A2 beauty shader because it's got two, um, two mat inputs. So I'm gonna connect my source first like that. The um, second mat input is for, for, the, um, for the, the mat itself to localize the effect. So if we switch to that now, let's switch off my preview. You see now the effect is just happening on the, uh, inside the mat. I wanna pay, uh, uh, want you to pay close attention to the bottom here of the nose because we get a, a little bit of an edge here. I don't know if you see it with the compression, but this is not a really a smooth transition. And there's a reason for that. Right now, A2 Beauty is looking everywhere in the picture to draw for the, for the um, detail search, to bring back the details. And that can lead to some hard edges. But we've got this second mat input, which is a um, custom detailed search area. So by that mat, we can tell A2 Beauty, just look in that areas of the mat to, um, for, for details to restore. So if we hook that up here, and switch on use custom detailed search. I'm gonna zoom in really close here. You see, we're getting a much softer result here. This is not a blur on the mat or anything. This is really just constraining the detailed search. And especially if you're tackling larger things, for example, this, um, this, uh, the, this crane here, then um, a, a custom search can help quite a lot because if you're working, for example, close to the eye, you might get details of that eye itself back into the, into the restore. So this is a really helpful thing that can, you can define this custom area. So, and another thing I want to say is what you really want to do is um, use A to Beauty locally. You want to apply a different setting to the, to the nose, for example, as for the cheeks, at least if you're this close, like in our example here, um, I know a shader like A2 Beauty tends itself to, to be this one bullet solution, but I think it really is more powerful if you think of it, okay, I'll use this one just for the nose and then I'll pull up another one and hook that up. Oops, let me change that. For example, for the cheeks and give that its own unique settings. And I think that way you can achieve a much uh, much better, much uh, more natural look. Yep. So there, so that's working. The, uh, that's properly, we can go with very little here. Yeah, but that's basically the idea. And before we leave the A2 Beauty, I want to um, introduce his cousin to you because while developing A2 Beauty, oops, sorry. Um, Autodesk also developed the washer. So the washer, it's, it's got a different algorithm. The, the idea is principally the same, but it's got a different algorithm. It's faster, it's maybe not as precise, but in some use cases, I found it quite helpful. So this one has got just two inputs. So you can't define the search area in this one. And for those of you, who um, played around with uh, Silhouette Paint, for example, this does something very similar to the uh, blemish brush in Silhouette. So we've got um, the wash amount and the grain amount. So if we dial back the grain down to zero, no, oh, to one, one is minimum, okay. So the wash amount is the amount of blur basically and then we can reintroduce with the grain some of the 
original artifacts. And we can define a threshold for that. So this is not really the best use case, but I wanted to introduce it to you anyhow. Yeah, I want to echo what Randy just put in the chat. Like, I mean, I saw in the release notes that there was something like a matchbox called washer. And then in my ignorance, I just assumed it was like the, like the paint tool and said, well, <laughs> if I ever need it, I'll go and look that up. So I find where, where was this? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> ignorance. I, was like, I, I could have used this a million times in the yeah, last couple of and, months. And it's one of those tools. You'll, you'll pull this up and I would say four out of five times you'll choose A to Beauty because it works better. But there are these one or two shots or one or two instances where, where it just doesn't, doesn't do it and this one works. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why I wanted to highlight that it's there. And by the way, same goes with the shading. This does the exact same thing as the shading uh, sliders in the A to Beauty. So it restores the highlights and the shadows back on top. So use them sparingly. These are really, really, um, yeah. They're great. That's great. And Christoph, thank you so much for uh, I mean, not only opening <laughs> opening my eyes, but and everybody's eyes. But the uh, the 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 way you illustrated using A2 Beauty, I thought was was perfect. Oh, thanks uh, so much. I mean, hey, tying in the the ML stuff from last week was a beautiful uh, natural flowing transition. So thank yeah. you for always thinking about. You we're, know, we're gonna the, we're gonna set show. this up as a multiple series. So I'm gonna... <laughs> right. this would be like a year long arc. <laughs> <laughs> right now, right. in the next episode. That's right. Uh, so. But uh, I just want to give mad props to Alex uh, for for spearheading the development of this yeah. tool. You know, it's yeah. it's just and been like a, a a gift to the whole community. So thank you, yeah, Alex. It's great work, and I use it every day. It's it's such a great tool. So that's thanks thanks to Alex and everyone involved. Randy was just asking a question. Uh, does anybody know if uh, what makes this different from a median blur, or from a median? Uh, Ivar. <laughs> Ivar, are you there? <laughs> Moving on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe Alex cool. can chime in later. It behaves different than a median blur, but I can't give you any technical specs or any, uh, but um, let's go to the GMAS tracer, what I would like to call my ode to the GMAS tracer, because Beautiful. I feel... Um, I feel this is such a powerful tool and it got some bad rap at the start when it was introduced before, because it was different. It was different to what we knew from the G-Mask. And um, I think what I also only realized over time is that this is really, this is not only technically based uh, upon action, but it is an action optimized for making mats. And if you know beauty work, you know, you, get, you need a lot of mats. And yeah, mm -hmm. machine learning is all swell, but in a lot of cases, you need, uh, you need your own uh, dedicated mats. And um, the first thing I wanna show, because I've been asking for this for ages, is that since Mocha 2020.5, you can import shapes from Mocha into the Gmask Tracer, which is yes. so awesome. And um, I'm going to this up. Oops, where is it? Where is my G mask? Wait. I just wanted to remind Load it. Everyone. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, my, my mistake. I have to. I was just going to cover for you. <laughs> I just oh, wanted to good. remind everyone that uh, if you, have yeah, a, if you do have a question, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel, uh, just in case someone doesn't have the chat window open. That way we can ask them. So just, to, just a quick sidestep into Mocha. I'll launch Mocha here very quickly. Um, so this is something I like to do with a lot of my beauty shots if the tracking isn't too hard, just to prep it, basically uh, track a lot of the planar surfaces I can find in a face. And uh, even if the brief doesn't initially cover, for example, the forehead or something, uh, if, I, if I once get down to tracking a shot, I just like to apply these and use later down the road. And um, this has been quite helpful. So I'm thinking of Mocha more and more in kind of a prep tool 
not just use it when the when when the traditional trackings don't work but rather run it through it like through a match moving tool generate those tracks and utilize them later down the road and what's now really great is that you can select any of these and say export shape data and you see now you've got a preset for the flame tracer which is the gmos tracer and you can export either a baked shape with a basic option or um, with the animation move to the axis, which is really great as well. So that's that. And I already loaded that up into my GMOS tracer, like here. And there it sits. Pretty neat, that's good. What also a lot of people don't know about the GMOS tracer, and that's what I find really cool, is um, it's got an integrated Kia. So, um, and this is really for, for beauty work, really nice that you've got a nice localized key. So I know I'm only going to key inside my mat and now I can select that shape and go over here and go to the tracer down here in that menu and switching to F8 to get my result view and hitting it again to get the mat view. I can now set up these two boxes. Now the colors might look familiar to you because the red is for the foreground and the green is for the background, like with any node and batch. So now you just pull the green box where you, um, where you want to stuff removed and the red where you want it kept. So you define your foreground, your background basically like that. And the nice thing is what I really like about this kind of keying is you can pull up as many of these as you like. So if I need another background to get rid of that stuff up here, I'll just add it, bring it there, get rid of that. And I can also animate this. So if I find a frame, for example, here, let's say for argument's sake that I want to get rid of this one as well, I can add another analysis here. So now I have to move my boxes, of course, like so, like so. And now flame would interpolate between those frames. And this way I can set up a really good key even for, yeah, for the little localized stuff. But I also use this for gr classic green screen keying. Um, and it's so nice to have a, a separate dedicated keyer for each and every shape. And it's yeah. basically taking um, the whole concept inside out rather than starting off on one key and then using various shapes to bring in other keys you're starting off with the shapes and setting up individual keys to, until they form a complete other. But I found this a really nice and, and um, um, intuitive way of keying. So I wanted to highlight that. I was so happy uh, to see this introduced back into the, the uh, GMS tracer or when the tools, I, was, I remember when the tracer boxes were first introduced back like in the year four or whenever it was that yeah. like they were brought out into the modular keyer. And uh, I mean, I remember the sample footage. It was like a lion, you know, yeah. the big mane and everything. And it's just, it's a really, it's one of those under, either underutilized or uh, underappreciated tools in yeah. Flame, especially as you described, because you can set that stuff. On and a mask it really piece. also really, really behaves different than, differently than the old tracer in, in the old G mask. It's a different algorithm altogether. And um, so I only encourage everybody to give this a shot. I think it's a great key. Christoph, so, there was one, qu one question in yeah. the chat about, uh, yeah. maybe just a clarification about the, the mask you exported from Mocha into GMS yeah. Tracer. Are there options for axis or, uh, or shape animation? Uh, I think that's basically the one that I highlighted. So you've got the basic, let's, let's try this out. I haven't, so this is, I'm winging it now, but well. So that's um, why they call it Logic Live. Exactly, exactly. So we're going to export the basic shape. Uh, that's the left eyebrow. We're going to save that. And I'm going to name this basic. So, all right. That's it. Gotcha. So this is my shape. Uh, my Sorry, my keyboard. Switch to German for some reason. So now we're back. Yes, great. Okay. So this is the shape we just had. So we've got the animation on the axis. So this is what it looks like in the uh, channel editor. 
So speed, rotation, scaling, I think shearing as well is all on that shape. So let's see what the basic one looks like. Um, oh, I'm gonna pull up another GMOS tracer and load that up. Left eyebrow basic. This looks a little bit different. I think there's a little bit of an alignment issue here. But as you can see, we don't even get an axis imported. So the animation seems to reside there. Yeah, sorry, this, this was totally winked. So this is not the result I would have expected. I always went with the shape, uh, with, a, with the axis and shape, which works neat for me, but yeah. So um, we'll, we'll have, this, uh, have another look at this. <laughs> Oh, thanks for, thanks for giving it a shot though. All right. I imagine if you did more, if there's, yeah, it's like if there's more shape animation versus yeah. axis animation, you can get that separate. Yeah. So um, next thing I wanted to highlight is um, like action, we've got multiple outputs out of the GMOS tracer. And what I find really helpful about that, it's okay. The one idea is, yeah, you just got one node instead of six, G masks, old styles, G masks. But the other thing is, if you look inside here, I use the motion vector to drive these uh, shapes. So if I switch now through the different outputs, those six are all driven by the same analysis. You, so you do one analysis, if that works, you can drive six mats with that. And we know that motion vectors are a little bit um, fidgety in regards to caching and all that. So at least that way, you only have to cache once and not like six or seven or eight times or something. Honestly, so, I hadn't heard. Hmm? I hadn't heard that. Uh, honestly, that's yeah. news. To me. Yeah, no, I must only wish, on people, side I wish people would speak up about it more online. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, another thing that maybe some people don't know about, and maybe that's why some people don't use motion vectors for Roto, is uh, let's take a look at our example here. So we've got once again the shot here. So now let's switch to mat view. Mat view, like that. So you see the mat is traveling, but the shape stays in, uh, in the same position. Well, this is due to a technical limitation. First, the shape gets drawn, and after that, the motion vectors get applied to it. And that that's why the GUI can't move along with that. Well, that makes rotoing pretty hard, but uh, there's a shader for that. So that in this case, this is a camera shader that um, Autodesk introduced, and that's the mat viewer that you can attach that to the camera. And by using that, if you go to the comp view, which you've got in the GMOS tracer, even though you need to output basically just the mats, you can, um, you, can out, uh, you, can, you can fill that area up. So now you, got, you can't move the GUI itself, but you can now interact oh just that. Oh and my God. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, this is great. And um, also, you can set this up in a couple of different ways. So you can choose your color, obviously. You can only uh, also choose to only show the semi-transparent areas. That is uh, quite helpful if you want to get in here a little bit with more <laughs> detail. And um, you can also do, do a slab comp like that. So, and of course this works, once you get it set up, this works on every, um, every output, you just have to activate it like that. So now you've got it there or on the cheek like that. Set it up like that. So oh, I'm go. speechless. This is the greatest. I, I've, 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 uh, I've, I've used motion vectors with the GMAS tracer before, but I had no idea about that, that matchbox. The yeah, that's, that was, oh, uh, I, I had a similar reaction when I learned about it. It's, uh, it's pretty helpful. Oh, this is the greatest episode ever. <laughs> Sorry, everybody uh, else. You're making me blush. So, um, wow. how long has that been available? The the Matt viewer. I know I see 2018 or 19. Wow. Oh. 
since year four. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> so, since I stopped reading release notes, is probably how long it's been. <laughs> <laughs> oh so my God. there's there's one more thing oh. I wanted to sh to show with the with the GMOS tracer, and that is I I said it at the beginning. It is basically an action optimized for masks. Action is a 3D compositing, compositing environment, right? So what you can do, and this is actually something I did on a job today, and which was quite helpful. You, uh, I'm pulling up action, that's the GMOS tracer, right? So some of you guys might have noticed the GMOS tracer contains a camera, which means we can import ourselves a match move like that. Fine. So now, oops, I have to switch my camera, of course, like so. All right. So now I've got all my tracking marks like that. And if my track is already, uh, my shot is already match moved, these can make my life a lot easier because now let's get rid of the material quickly. So wait, that, that one. Now we can take a G mask attach it to that and basically now that g mask gets filmed so to speak through the camera oops so now that sits in there and this is pretty neat and awesome. big shout out to fred warren and to randy because uh, my first posting on the new forum was about this. When I prepped this for today, I thought, yeah, and now I want to take this to the trace. And now I want to key that, lay that out of focus lady. I went to F8 to get into my object view and this happened. Wait, let me see, show this once more. So suddenly my shape got to a position where it went back to default. And there is a little knob you have to switch. And it's, um, I didn't find it for uh, anything. And to make another point, I asked this question, I think a year ago on the logic group and I couldn't find my posting anymore. And I know Randy made a big point out of that uh, Facebook uh, is poorly searchable. So I posted on the new forum and now it's there for eternity for anybody to look up if you don't find this one because under the mask tab, here's this out of frame button. You have to change that. Oh my God. To your camera. And now you can go to the tracer, add your analysis. So now you've got a 3D track shape utilizing the GMOS tracer. This is pretty neat. Okay, so just in the course of 60 seconds, you've <laughs> shown the world something that they didn't know existed. You've solved like five problems that everyone struggles with every day identify a button that we've never played with and justified <laughs> the whole creation of the new forum so this i mean you're clearly like the greatest guest we've ever had here so thank oh, you. stop it yes all right Thanks, okay top so that so That's really christoph this is amazing cool oh, thanks so much yeah. So, and uh, by the way, I, I should give one big shout out at this point, um, because this is all um, from, from the FX PhD courses I did. And I just wanted to say a big thanks to John Montgomery for letting me use this material for today. And um, yeah, if you, if you want to listen to me babbling a little bit more, there are a couple of courses on, on FX PhD where you can do just that. Yeah, and in the chat, MB mentioned, uh... Uh, that you that you were showing this uh, you had shown some of these rather in the uh, in as part of your FX PhD courses so definitely yeah. check them out. So anybody who already watched them, sorry, it's it's a little bit of a repeat, but also some new stuff in there hopefully. So okay, so the next item on my list would be a little selection of beauty matchbox shaders that I find really helpful. So I'm gonna switch over here. So the first one um, is by Louis Saunders and it's wireless and it's, it's really a neat little wire removal. So the way this works, oops, I have to reset this. We're gonna start fresh. 
So in the result view and only in the result view, you'll get this little line here. So you can now pull up a start and an end. You can animate this. You, these are actually available in the channel editor. So you can track them if that's applicable in that shot. So now you can draw a straight line. However, our hair that we want to remove, this one here, is not straight. So we've got a curve to adjust the curvature. And we've got the hook, which basically pivots it to one side or the other. So these are the controls you have to define a wire you want to remove. What, what I should mention is initially this one is mostly off and you don't see that line. So you have to switch on draw workings. Once you got it in position, you turn it off and you dial up the radius just until this goes away. And what it does is it's kind of a zip brush. So it tries to clone in from left and right until it fills that up. And you can also adjust the angle at which it restores. It wouldn't make much of a difference on this very out of focus skin. But uh, if you've got a sharper, more defined background, then you, it's worth playing around with the restore mix and also with the angle to get it into shape. It is prone to a little bit of artifacting, especially here on the, um, on the edge of the frame. Um, let me see if I can switch those icons off. Yeah, there. So you see you're getting this hard edge. So often this needs a little bit of cleanup work, but it's a great way to get rid of uh, little stray flyaways. And what's really neat, you can stack a million of these upon each other and it's still really, really, really fast. So I've, I've had hair jobs where I literally put up, I think, 40 matchbox Alice wireless shaders after the other and you could still shuttle through that clip. That was awesome. And um, then we get to Mr. Cleaner Flame, which is uh, <laughs> everybody's best friend, the Croc Beauty shader. And I don't think I have to say much about this. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, I think one of Eva's best pieces, honestly, this is amazing. So I'm gonna reset this back to default. And the one thing I just really find, this is really play around with the settings, find, find the way the, uh, it works best for you. The only thing I find that you need to take notice of is you can define the skin color. So you always get a little bit of a tint, which at sometimes can be really, really helpful. If you don't want that, just turn the shine amount to zero. So that way you're getting something akin to the washer. It behaves differently, of course. It's a different uh, math under the hood. But um, this, is, um, this is the way I like to set it up, turn down the shine first. And in the end, I, I may, might play around with it if I want to enable such a look. But probably uh, Eva can say much, much more about this. I just wanted to quickly highlight it because this has been used, I think, to clean up skin, of course. I've read about floors being cleaned with it, um, chicken, and... Um, <laughs> and, and um, curtains. So this has been used for everything. I've used All it for right. curtains, I've used it for clothing, I've used it for tablecloths. <laughs> See, Mr. Clean of Flame. So, <laughs> so then another Louis Saunders shade I really like um, as a blur. It's, this is kind of a median filter really, um, but a really fast one. And it does something really nice I find to the skin. So once again, bring down the edge preservation, which is, the restore to zero and then dial up the blur. So that, that way it just looks like a normal blur. But once you bring in edge preservation, you really um, get this, get this um, defined areas look. So this might be helpful in combination with, for example, uh, the next technique I'm showing, which is high pass filtering. So let's copy this over here. So high pass filtering of frequency separation is basically the idea that um, you can independently work on the color aspect of your image as well as the details aspect of the image. And there is, an, um, there is a shader for that, of course, which can, generates you this high pass, which is just the details of the image. Now this has got a very low setting, excuse me, sorry. So if we crank this up a little bit, 
like that. We're getting somewhere. And then the idea is with a blurred version of your, of your um, color layer and this that you use a comp node to recombine then by using an overlay mode. And there are different ways you can achieve this. There, there are, I think, 50,000 different ways to achieve <laughs> a high pass filtering. But this is one way that works really nice. And now you can imagine, for example, um, that we can now, for example, if we take a look at that zit, we can now just use a paint to, for example, clone out that. I'm doing a poor job here, but something like that. So now I just painted on the details without um, affecting the color or, or stamping that. And now we can, for example, try to get rid of this readiness, uh, reddishness there. So something like that. Let me set up a context here like that. Ah, all right, two up view for the rescue. And here, let me just clone this away. So you see, I can keep some of that detail in there. So this is a pretty neat technique. And maybe we can blur this up. Let's pull up the kernel. So you see, we're keeping, let me undo that redo that. So this is a nice way of, of blurring the underlying color to get rid of, for example, splotchiness in the skin, but you keep that skin texture. So that's a really neat, neat way of doing that. And with the, with the shader, you can adjust the strength after the fact. So you can bring this up to get more detail or bring it down. So I wouldn't use it in the way I'm showing it here on the whole picture, but it's rather something for, for a small area but for illustration purposes, I think this works. Okay. Stuff, uh, Randy was just wondering in the chat, uh, does, yeah. that pass the, does that pass the difference test? Like if you difference matted the before and after? Let's see. I mean, I, I wouldn't think so because I, I put an arbitrary value here in the, in the strength. So I think if I really want to do the before and after, I'd, I'd probably use use something like a multiply with a blur set it up more traditionally but um i like i just really like the ease of use so um let me think how would we set this up i think uh i have to look i have to look it up sorry this is um i i think right now it wouldn't pass the difference test mm -hmm. Um, because this is really something this way, as I said, I use that on a localized area. I don't use it for the, for the whole face. So this is, this is actually what I like that I can adjust this strength to taste. So I don't want to use it like exactly for the same, but yeah, I, I, I know that there is a way to set it up pretty easily with a, with an, uh, with a multiply, but before I get stuck here, um, mm -hmm. if it's okay with you, I would rather move on. Oh yeah, no, no, totally. Cool. All right. So one thing that was, um, I was always envy of, of the After Effects guys was uh, spline blurring because it's really neat for hair retouch if you can blur along a spline and for other use cases, of course. And once again, Louis Saunders uh, did, did a great shader for that. Um, that shader needs a matte input and that matte, that's the only thing you really have to, to get your head around, uh, needs to define not the area where the um, where the blur is applied, but rather the the spline along which is blurred. As we, I'll I'll show you what I mean. So I I wanted to blur that side of our hair to get rid of all these flyaways, and I wanted to do it in a way that it's got the correct direction here, that it's a little bit more curved down here, so that it follows along the underlying uh, line of that hair. And um, the way this works is if we take a look at the mat, everything that's totally white gets ignored. Everything that's totally black gets ignored. But all the, all the gradient stuff in between, that's where, where the, um, where the sp 
spline gets picked up, so to speak. So if we connect this to the spline blur and take a look, so now you see what's happening. This is, of course, total rubbish, but here, and I've, this is, these are the default settings. So if I bring this down, you can see what's happening. But you see that the blur happens in a different direction here than, for example, up here. And I, if I would give this a little bit more care, I could really follow along um, that curvature of the hair with that spline blur. Of course, what I need to do to localize this is um, to set up a second mat like this one, for example. Great job. Um, like so. And then comp that. Wait, comp that on top of that, like so. And that way you could patch this through um, to the end. So the and and this is just the one thing to know. Even though the shaders got six or seven inputs, you only can uh, effectively input to the front and the map and the map is where the spline gets applied. It's worth playing around with because you can achieve some really great stuff with that. So the last thing I want to really quickly mention is the Croc skin shader, which is just a skin generator. And this is helpful, for example, when, when there's already very little detail on, on, um, on a person's skin, or if that's really that, that part is so messy that you want to introduce some smoother texture, then this can really be helpful. Of course, you then need to track it in, maybe do a high pass filtering to apply it as an overlay and all that. But you've got some nice uh, options here to set up uh, different skin types. So you can introduce details, you can, um, what can we do, for example, we can uh, enlarge in the pores, like so. So you can set this up really to your liking and then track it into your shots. So this is something I don't use that too often, but I find it really, really helpful that it's there. So that would be my top six beauty shaders, I would say. That's great. Cool. Oh my goodness, what a show. Does, so, <laughs> does anybody have any questions uh, about these shaders? Or any final questions about these shaders for Christoph? All right, on to the next thing then. Okay, I've got one more thing. And I think that's, that's something that's also from one of the FX PhD classes, but it's also one of these things. And I found this out totally by accident, but accident. But this, this was kind of like, like the what, what on earth moments. Um, because I read online quite a lot the request, can't we please have a warp stabilizer in Flame? And I, I, I hate to say, we got that. It's been there, kind of. All right, so the, the example is this. This is a clip um, from, from my class. The retouch is all done on that. So now we need to stabilize it because if we take a look at it, let's do that on the timeline maybe. Where we got, oh, let's take a look at the original rush. Come on flame. Oh, come on, there we go. There we go. What's going on here? It wouldn't be a demo. I'll do a run play. Demo, I'll do a run play and then it should work. So the thing is we've got this moving movement of her hand going down while the camera pans up and we uh, she she caresses her skin so that gets uh, uh gets down a little bit so it's 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 just a little bit jittery and you want to stabilize that and that I, I thought yeah well this is something nice to do for class we can we can play around with planar tracking a little bit or something and it all didn't work i couldn't stabilize that shot for the for the love of it. And this is when I came across this little nugget. So I did an motion analysis 
So you know, all know that. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> so yeah, all right. Let's let's do this from the start. Could we please? Yeah. So I'll pull up the surface in use so that we get, we are fresh here, like that. So now we connect our motion analysis and down on the tracking tab, we can set up reference frames. The idea behind that was that you could use this to stabilize shots so that you can set up a reference frame to say, okay, now this get locked, gets locked to the frame. So if we go to the result view, you see what's happening up here flame tries to lock that picture into position for the whole time. And we get all these artifacts and this is not what we want. However, what we can do is we can set up multiple frames like so. And now, this is the love of motion vectors. Um, we can set up these in between and I'm doing this arbitrary now, but what I'd done in the original class, I actually took a good look where it would make sense to set a frame. And what I came up with in the end was this. So this is not like every four frames or something, but I rather took, took a look where the frames made sense, where, where I liked the movement, where it wasn't too, uh, too slow or too um, fast from the previous picture, but where it had a good, nice movement. And that's where I set up a reference frame and let flame interpolate the rest in between. And that really worked nicely. I know it's, it's um, probably not the best example to show over Zoom because it's a very subtle thing, but I got the feeling that the movement was much smoother and it took good care of the corresponding or, or um, correlating movements up and down of the camera and the fingers and all that. And with very little artifacts to paint out between the fingers and all that. So give that a shot because that way you can really build yourself a kind of a warp stabilizer. And in my opinion, with more control over it than for example, in After Effects. That's fantastic. All right. Oh man. Wow. That, I'm just speechless. This was great. <laughs> cool, glad, glad you liked it. Oh, this is great. I'm also starting like 75, you know, beauty jobs in the next six weeks. So I feel like, you know, he's energized. <laughs> cool. Oh my God, this is great. Christoph, I'm just, thank you, man. Thank you for this. And thank you for all that you do uh, to share, you know, share knowledge and stuff with the community. It's just, it's just, it's really wonderful. It kind of embodies the spirit of everything that, you know, we've been trying to do here. So from the oh, bottom of my heart, man, thank you so for, much all for that. having me. Of course. Does anybody have any other questions for Christoph? I think everybody's speechless. <laughs> yes, Randy wants to know what your day rate is. <laughs> He'll have his people call your people. Cool. Oh man. All right. Amazing. Cool. Well, thanks man. I appreciate it. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna stop your share here. Sure. That way I can see your beautiful face. And I can say thank you face to face. And uh, this is great. Let's give cool. away some prizes. Who's, uh, yeah. who's up for that? Everybody, of course. All right. Oh, I got to. Oh, damn it. That's two weeks in a row. I zipped right by. There we go. Right. Here we go. It's logic prize time, ladies and gentlemen. I've got two, count them, two of these gorgeous beautiful i'm gonna hold it in here so it doesn't fall out like last week logic phone chargers that's right big bucks no whammies okay this has now become uh one of my favorite parts of uh of hosting logic live i have a list here of everybody who's in the meeting i'm going to share the screen i'm going to go to the random name picker website which is brought to you by um GoDaddy, I guess, and, uh, and, and many other things. All right, so I'm gonna put the names in here. And uh, 
And I'm gonna pick a random name. Who's ready? And the winner is Mindy. Oh my goodness. Let's give it up for Mindy. Congrats, Mindy. Wonderful. All right, but that's just one uh, of the Logic phone chargers that I have to give away for today. The other one is for uh, the um, two second tip, I'm sorry, two sentence tips that were over on the forum. If you haven't had a chance to check them out, please check them out. They're fantastic. I think it was Jamie Beckwith had one about uh, BFX, uh, like you, that whole like the, the endless struggle of like having to, oh, there it is. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, just posted the link in the chat. The endless struggle of like, I have this set up and I wanna slide it like two frames or whatever. Uh, it was just the great tip of, of making it a BFX and then you can offset the BFX. But by all means, please head over to the forum and, uh, oh, Randy, you gotta set your uh, comments to all panelists and attendees. So Randy's gonna do that and repaste the link. And I am going to pick uh, another winner. So we're gonna give another one of these away to everybody, to, to one person rather who, contributed uh, a tip. So let's go back over to the random name picker and delete all those. And these are all the wonderful human beings and members of our community uh, who went ahead and contributed something to the two sentence tips. So let's go here. Pick another name. Carlos Campos. Let's give it up for Carlos, ladies and gentlemen. I will reach out to Carlos and make sure that he gets his Logic Live or his Logic uh, phone charger, courtesy of our friends at Synesis. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. And let's close this thing out. If I can ever move my mouse. There we go. Nice. All right. So coming up, everybody, uh, on Logic Live. Oh, you know, I almost forgot you two, these two, Mindy and Carlos, you can be uh, just as cool as Carrie and Miriam and, uh, and Quinn and, uh, and Peter, who, uh, who's, our, who's charges in the mail by, uh, you know, make sure you share a, a picture of you with your, your, your Logic phone charger. Okay. Thank you. This is what happens when you don't remember <laughs> the slideshow that you built for Logic Live. Uh, we've got an action-packed uh, few weeks coming up on Logic Live. I'm going to go ahead and paste the uh, sign-up links or the registration links in chat. Uh, next week, uh, we are off, okay? So uh, not so exciting next week. But uh, after that, we're coming back on October 4th with the One Frame of White reunion show. We got Deepak Baranwal, Caleb Cahill, Gabriel Garrido, Darren Hoffmeyer, and Greg Malone. Greg Paul Malone, excuse me. I'm never going to live that one down. Uh, who's here with us today, and uh, they're all going to join us for uh, what's what's sure to be, what's sure to rival any um, any Real Housewives reunion show. Uh, but we're, you know, it'll be great to catch up with everybody and see how they're doing and talk all about One Frame of White. Followed by October 11th is going to be the big One Frame of White. <laughs> that's that, my friends, is how you lose. <laughs> it's how you lose a star. It was in his rider, really. It was. What did I show you? All the demands he had for the green room and everything. It was amazing. Um, October eleventh, we're going to announce the winners of uh, One Frame of White twenty twenty, and uh, you'll be the first to hear this. But um, uh, the lovely and talented Grant K is going to be live with us here as our announcer. I'm so looking forward to that. Oh, Charles, you were there for the green M and M's. <laughs> Charles and I shared an, shared a, a, a celebrity writer once experience. Um, October 18th is the role of a flame assistant with the amazing Amanda Elliott. And October 25th, the Mocha Deep Dive with Mary Poplin of Boris FX. So as I said, One Frame of White is on. You can enter now at oneframeofwhite.com. And please, 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 if you haven't already done so, sign up over at forum.logic.tv. Randy uh, posted a link. Randy, would you mind posting that link again in the chat? Uh, that if you haven't signed up, there it is. If you haven't signed up uh, and use that link, Randy will bump you all the way up to 12-bit. We have different uh, rankings for, you know, the, um, uh, for the forum, 8-bit, uh, 10-bit, 12-bit, 16-bit, uh, based on participation. So uh, each one unlocks different areas of the forum. So Randy will bump you up. Uh, this episode and all past episodes are available at logic.tv. 
And if you haven't checked out the Logic Podcast, please do. I'm going to have more episodes for you coming soon. And uh, I want to thank everybody who helped with the uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel um, uh, telethon <laughs> that we had over the last week or so. Thank you, Randy. Uh, we we are, I want to get those numbers up to 1,000. And it's uh, we, we added, I think, almost 100 last week. So if you haven't signed up, please go ahead. Thank you. Oh, your wife subscribed too? <laughs> My kids subscribed. <laughs> so thank you, everybody who helped to get the numbers up. And of course, thanks as always to our friends at Cinesis for sponsoring Logic Live. That's going to do it for Logic Live this week, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Christoph. Thank you.